I'd like to preface this talk by saying it was pointed out to me very firmly during my qualifying exam that I don't actually work with a true invasive species. It's actually a range expander. I had a member, a member of the committee who was very firm on that. So sorry for crashing your party, but let's, let's just roll with it. Also, these results are fairly preliminary results, pretty early results, so I actually would really appreciate lots of feedback and input on your, you know, what you think would be interesting to look at. So I'm actually co-supervised by two professors, and the first professor I work with, for the last 25 years, she's been looking at adaptation to divergent oxygen gradients. So obviously, oxygen is an incredibly strong selective pressure, especially in aquatic environments where it's much less available than it is in the air. Um, when water flows through swamps like this, the biochemical oxygen demand will deplete the oxygen down to a level of maybe 0.5 mg per liter or even lower, which compared to fully saturated at the altitude and the temperature we're working at, that's around 7.5 or 8 mg. Um, and you have these incredibly strong oxygen gradients. This is maybe 2 meters distance. And this is the swamp water and this is the turbid river water. Yet somehow, fish like these little guys, Enteromyas numerii, can survive. In most fish would die below about 1.5. Yet somehow they can live without breathing air. Um, obviously, there's things like larger gills. This has been very well established in my lab years ago. There's larger gills. There's larger heads to fit those gills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's important to point out that these are not completely free adaptations. You think, oh, you just you have bigger gills. There's actually really strong trade-offs with large gills. For instance, um, feeding morphology, uh, feeding performance is usually quite um, adversely affected by. Uh, having these really kind of large heads and large gills that are interfering with your jaws. Um, so that's one side of my thesis. The other professor I work with is more an evolutionary theorist. Um, so the question becomes, when these organisms spread into novel environments, how predictable and how repeatable is adaptation to novel environments? Um, as we know, there is many reasons why organisms might spread into novel environments. In this particular case, we have evidence for climate change, which I will show on the next slide. Um, but I'm not as much interested in why they are spreading, but when they do spread, will range expanders or invasives recapitulate previous adaptations? If they, if they have adapted to a strong selective pressure in the past, how consistent, how predictable is their adaptation to that same stress or a very similar stress again? Right? And some of you might recognize this is what's often termed, not by everybody, as parallel evolution. Um, how predictable and how repeatable is evolution? Um, you can look at this both intra and inter specifically. So I mentioned before that my supervisor has worked with Enteromyas numerii for 25 years. Uh, I am not working, well, I am working with numerii, but mostly I'm working with Enteromyas pleurogramma, a member of the same genus. Um, and you'll see why I'm working with them in a second. Uh, but hopefully, eventually, my project will look at both intra and interspecific parallelism. The system I work with is actually in the western region of Uganda, a place called Nkerede University Biological Field Station in Kabali National Park. I have to say it's a pretty fun field state to work at. Um, but the point of the talk today is Enteromyosoplerogramma is, as you can see, native to the lower reaches of these two rivers, the Dura River and the Mpanga River. However, in about the last five years, it has moved upriver into stretches of the river that were previously only occupied by Enteromyas numeriae, the one that my boss has been studying for the last 25 years. These have about a, up to about a 250 at its highest point difference in elevation, which means they should be about a degree, degree and a half cooler, um, just by elevation alone. And over the last 20 years, my boss has actually tracked a one and a half, two degree rise in temperature. So we're presuming this is driven by climate change. We are not entirely sure yet, but it's staying very strongly, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, look over there. Um, so rather than being complex there, let's look at this schematically. We have normoxic rivers and hypoxic swamps. We have the native range and we have the expanding range. And the, as they have moved upriver, they've had to readapt to hypoxia. So then the question becomes, pretty simply, are the differences we see there in the native range the same as the differences that we see in the expansion range? And just for clarity for the rest of this talk, 
If it's a dotted line, it's a hypoxic population. If it's a solid line, it's a normoxic population. If it's green, it's native. If it's red, it's expanding. Um, I put up this slide, and anyone who's ever done guild work just cringed, because when gills are obviously the functional adaptation to hypoxia that is usually of most interest, but there are a lot of work, but has to be done. So if you look at, for instance, gill area here, two-dimensional gill area, which is a very good proxy for total gill surface area, um, I mean, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty clear, that the hypoxic fish with the dotted line in their native range where they're long and well adapted have bigger gills. Okay. Now, if we can, that's the same figure again. If we compare that to the fish in their expanding range, do we see the same thing? Are they growing bigger gills again? Well, yes, they are. Um, it's not as pronounced. We're basically seeing adaptation in the same direction, but less divergent. Now, they've only invaded in maybe, this is one or two generations, and we're already seeing this kind of uh, trait displacement. So, it's pretty significant. Now, gills are a lot of work. So something we're trying to do is, instead of dissecting out the gills and having to measure them under a microscope, et cetera, et cetera, perhaps something we can do in the field, perhaps something we can even do non-lethally, is, those of you who know fish anatomy, the operculum is the hard covering over the gill, and, well, obviously if you have bigger gills, you have a bigger operculum as well. Usually, not always. So can we see signatures of this enlarged gills in the operculum as well? And this is what they look like in their native range. You can see, yes, the fish uh, from the hypoxic environments have larger opercula. Well, it's a little bit more muddled in the, in the uh, expansion range. Once we mass standardize it and stuff, they all pretty much look the same. Although, maybe if you get a larger sample size, it might be easier to see. We'll get to that in a second. Even this going, looking under a microscope, you know, measuring the area of the opercula, tracing it out, there's an even faster way to do it, which is, some of you might have seen the little dots on the previous picture, here it is again, geometric morphometrics. You basically, yourself, or if you're lucky, you have an undergrad come in and help you, click through, and on every single picture of the fish, click, 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 click. And this is a great technique, because we can even do it without having to kill the fish. Um, so from these landmark photographs, we can get size and shape data, and it's much, much faster than dissection. Once you have that data, you do a principal components or discriminant analysis, and you can see what is the overall change in morphology of these fish across these gradients. Again, in their native range, in their expanding range, are they recapitulating adaptation to strong stresses? So, in total n-dimensional morph space, which personally hurts my brain, um, this is the distance, this is how divergent, how different they are. So, the two most different populations are the native hypoxic fish and the expanding normoxic fish. Surprise, surprise. Uh, the least divergent fish are these, which we presume is the source population, with the two expanding populations, and then, of course, the comparison between the expanding populations, as you can see. The lowest numbers down here are circled. And all of these differences are highly, highly, highly significant. But, personally, like I said, I kind of, n-dimensional space makes my brain hurt, so, we do a principal components analysis. Um, we have PC1 and PC4, which represented 20, almost 30% of the variance in total, where bending moments of fish weren't completely straight in the photograph. Sorry, I was learning how to do it. Um, but the single largest kind of biological change we saw was actually a change in the size of the opercula. As you can see here in this photograph, basically what is happening as the PC changes, you can see these points are moving inwards or outwards, depending on which way you go on the axis. That is to say, the opercula is getting bigger or smaller. Um, the PC3, which was another strong one, is an independent flow adaptation. The thing is, we have a lot of, it can be hard to parse apart what is flow and what is adaptation of hypoxia because the swamps are very low flow, the rivers are very high flow, so we don't have a fully cross design. Um, you can look at this in multi-dimensional space, and as you can see, there's a pretty clear-ish effect of the green fish are all up here, which are the intermediate, uh, sorry, you can see an effect going on. It's a little bit clearer if you flip over to just a simple distribution. As you can see, the hypoxic fish, the dotted lines, have larger gills, uh, or sorry, I should say larger opercular area, which correlates with larger gills. Um, 
it's not quite significant in some cases. Um, we do have some statistical power issues. We have a couple groups that are underrepresented right now. That's something we are trying to address, address and move on. But still, we're seeing kind of broadly the same trends. If you look at it hard enough, and maybe we just need more fish. Um, but to wrap it up, because I think I'm getting close to the end of my time, uh, Entromyosin pleurogramma, the fish I work with, is showing readaptation to extreme environmental stress, hypoxia, in a climate change mediated range expansion. Geometric morphometrics can possibly, probably, maybe substitute for direct gill measurements because that would certainly save a lot of work, we hope. Um, but it does definitely require a lot larger sample sizes as what we've seen. Um, but geomorph is probably 1 50th of the work of the actual traditional gill dissections. Current groups are underrepresented. We're trying to solve that. And the current work that we're working on is expanding the sample size and integrating population genetics as well as the morphology of the native species that's long adapted in the exact same swamp as they are now invading into. So with that, I'd like to say many, many thanks to my supervisors, Lauren Chapman and Andrew Hendry, all my lab mates, Emmanuel, Peter, and Robert, my field assistants in Uganda, and Audrey and Igor for all their hard work in the lab. We don't know exactly, so the question was how many generations. We don't know exactly their maximum lifespan. Um, we've caught individuals that were, we know, at least five years old. Um, it's been about five years. That being said, they probably reached sexual maturity much easier, much earlier, so that's why I said a couple. Uh, my guess would be two, if you, if you wanted a number on it. I'm just saying There, there is certainly a large degree of plasticity to juveniles, so I can't say that the change we're seeing in the, in the expanders is adaptive. It's entirely possible that is all plasticity we're seeing, and that is kind of their range of plastic response, and that we will, over time, start to see more and more the trait values move apart. But we're seeing at least kind of movement in the same direction, even over like one or two generations. You might have said this, what's the dispersal distance like? Do you have a fish moving from hypoxic up to the other hypoxic within its lifetime? In the swamps, they're known to disperse maybe a couple hundred meters. In the rivers, it's much farther, on the order of several kilometers. The distance they would have had to disperse up is about 20 kilometers. Um, we are currently in the process of doing the population genetics, so hopefully we'll get a good idea of you know, what was the founder size of the population um, that they came from the source we're presuming geographically. There's only one they could come from, and I don't think people are spreading these around, but it's possible. So we'd like to confirm kind of for exactly that reason. Do you have an estimate of the population size in the native region? In the native region? Oh, many thousands. Census size. Effective size? Again, once we have the genetic data, I'll be able to answer that question. But census size is thousands or tens of thousands. Who's next to the bridge? <laughs>